times, but God's not a jokester. He's not a prankster. He doesn't do tricks, okay? He doesn't have you to do stuff just so you can get up and stretch your legs. Amen? When he does stuff, especially when he does it, when he confirms stuff like that, it has a spiritual power to it. Amen? And that has been accomplished this morning. So if we get nothing else done this morning, that has been accomplished. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord another hand. Well, I let you sit down, didn't I? It's all right, though. It's okay. I can just put three or four minutes of filler in here if you're tired. No, you're okay? All right, then stand up again, please. Amen. John chapter number 5, we read from it, preached from it last week, John chapter number 5. And I've actually, this is interesting, I don't know how this will go because I really only have like one point left that I didn't get to preach last week. So we'll, I don't know how long one point's going to last. Um, I've done six points in 30 minutes and one point in an hour, so I don't know how that's going to go. But uh, we'll see. It is a holiday weekend, uh, which now that I have you here in church doesn't mean anything to me. Amen. Thank you for not going to the lake today and staying and coming. And if you did go to the lake for going ahead and driving into church, amen. When I was a kid, mom and dad do that sometimes. They'd go to the river and stay. And I can remember driving back for church a few times, and I hated it as a kid. It's like, why can't we stay and fish? You know why we couldn't stay and fish? You see where I am today? Now, please don't get mad at me. I'm not talking about an occasional vacation, but I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, it's amazing. Church folk take vacation on their vacation, and they take vacation on when pastor takes vacation, and they take vacation when Sister Angel takes vacation, and they just take vacation, all these vacations. Well, so-and-so ain't going to be there, so I ain't going to be there. Well, that's not the way it works. Hey, Amen. You take your vacation and get your hind end back here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's the worst thing I ever hear to hear the crowd was low because I wasn't here. I hate that. That's just putting more pressure on me I don't need. Stop it. Amen. God is good. Thank you for being here. John chapter 5, verse number 2. See, I've got to let you sit through that whole thing. I didn't do it, did I? Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Having five porches in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season in the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in to the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath day. I want to preach to you the thought you don't have to be the first one in. But I believe that this pool of Bethesda is a metaphor for the church. Okay, it's metaphoric. It's a metaphor for the church. Now, I'm not the one, first one to ever come up with that. In fact, when God dropped that in my heart, I hadn't. I don't think I'd ever heard it preached on. But when he, but maybe I don't know. Yeah, I hear a lot of stuff over the years. But when he dropped it in my heart, I did what I usually do. Um, I go to the ultimate source of wisdom and I googled. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 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 right, amen, okay. Anyways, but I did Google, and what I usually do is if I'm looking at something, um, I want to know what other people's thoughts are on it. And so I Googled, um, uh, I think I Googled John chapter 5 and the verse and, and put sermon in the deal, and so all this stuff started popping up. And, and I realized that I'm not the first one to ever come up with this. In fact, many, several people, uh, old and more modern, have preached 
that this is metaphoric of the church. And that's, that's a powerful thing because I need you to understand I didn't come up with this whole cloth. I truly believe that God was trying to teach us, all right, that this is the way the church functions or the way that it works. Now, I, 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 as quickly as I can, I'll go back through and recap. I, I, I will tell you, we know that it came to the sheep gate. Literally, it says sheep market in the King James. But you, to enter into that pool, it was, a great, it was a pool that was surrounded by a building that had five porches. But to get there, you had to go through the sheep gate. Metaphoric again, there's only one good shepherd, the great shepherd. Now, and, and I might have confused some people last week. I told you, I am not your shepherd. And by saying that, I mean this. You need to look to the one, the author and the finisher of your faith. That's what you need to look at. People who get their eyes on man get disappointed. People who get their eyes on men end up messing, end up, messing up eventually because whoever they follow end up being human and you're surprised why. We take people, we put them on pedestals and we act like they ought to be something they can never be. And that's Jesus Christ. There's only one, one let me say it again. One good shepherd. Amen. The rest of us are wannabes. Yeah, I'm growing up in the stature of Christ. I'm growing up to try to be. But anybody that acts like they've made it, you need to run as fast as you can. I'm just saying. Amen. Amen. So the entrance into the church is not Pastor Todd nor any other pastor in the Oak Grove, Berryville, Green Forest area. Are you listening? Had somebody the other day tell me, yeah, I went down to so-and-so church. Yeah, they saved me. No, they didn't. If you think they did, just wait till the day you finally check out of here one way or another and try standing at the gate and telling them that. Amen? There's one Savior of the world, by the way. His name's Jesus Christ. Amen? And guess what? While we're just being politically incorrect, I might as well as offend as many people as I can. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's not Islam. It's not Hare Krishna. It's not any of the other, quote, world religions that you hear about. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life, and no man gets to the Father except through me. Honey, it is Jesus and Jesus alone. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have God, and you don't have heaven. You can strap as many bombs to your chest as you want to and blow up as many innocent people as you want to, but the God you're about to meet ain't got anything to do with the God of heaven. The God you're about to meet, you're going to find out, is darkness. Amen. One gate to that church, that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we get to that. See, I'm spending way too much time on the introduction. See, there we go. We get into the pool, and you are surrounded by what this, this, this building that's, that goes around the pool. And it has, what the Bible says, five porches held up by pillars that hold, and it's literally the five pillars that holds the roof on. I preached about it last week. It is the fivefold ministry, all right? Apostles, teachers, prophets, evangelists. Who else? There you go. You think I left me out? I just wanted you to say it. Amen. Five-fold ministry. It is the roof, the covering, if you will. Are you listening? Of the church. Weak churches, weakened, anemic believers leave parts out. If your body is deficient in something, you will know it before long. And spiritually speaking... You can be deficient without your full covering if you leave parts out. Amen? I enjoy listening to a good evangelist. Why? Because I get inside, I don't get anywhere else. Amen? But you need pastoral guidance. Amen? You need a good teacher. And we have, in my opinion, some of the best here. That's my personal opinion. Now, let's move on. Last thing I talked about 
After I discussed with you in the whole message, the body of the message last week was about being all these different sick people and these different people with challenges that lay literally around the pool waiting for the water to be troubled and waiting for, because, and, and that's, a, that's metaphoric. Now listen, this, this it almost seems backwards, but it's not backwards. It makes sense because people say, well, if the church is supposed to be powerful and it's supposed to have all this stuff going on, the Holy Ghost is supposed to be flowing, then what's all these sick people doing? Well, how many know moths come to a flame? It's a little bit like the old adage, I don't go to church, there's too many hypocrites in church. There are hypocrites in church. There's a lot of them. Sounds like you're one of them. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. I digress. I seen it posted on Facebook the other day. The first time I heard it was about 25 years ago. Somebody was giving this other guy credit. That's fine. I don't care who gets the credit for the statement. But the reality is, 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 is said on here, it said, I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites. But there's, but, you, but there's hypocrites in Walmart, Target, and Best Buy, and you shop there. <laughs> that's true why does it surprise you that the place that says come all sinners come and get saved come and get forgiveness come and get help come and get your blessing come and get healed why does it surprise you that sinners come to church now I'm not talking about you holy saints that have been saved for 20 years and still acting like sinners I got to get to point one. I'm still in my introduction. Boy, this is good. I'm not talking about people. And, I, and I'm surprised how big of a baby people can be from time to time. Just sell up, won't even talk to you. Get mad at you, won't even speak. Oh, you're God's man of woman of faith and filled with the Holy Ghost. You won't even talk to me. What's wrong with you? Amen? What is Oh, God, I got to go. I got to go. Got to go. What is it? What is it about? What is it about some people who feel that they have this? They, they're so connected with God, they get to judge everybody else. Amen. Yeah, I know it. All six of you. Praise God. Amen. It's all right. I came this morning to hack off the devil. Now I know who's mad. Amen. <laughs> but we're laying around this pool all of these conditions that nobody else can fix. And in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament version of that, it is the first, when the water's troubled, the first one in gets their blessing. It took Jesus to come and show you that you ain't got to wait on the water. Okay. Now, listen. I'm, I'm going to share something with you, and I'm going to move on. It's already 1220. Okay. I, I, I'll move on. I'll share something with you. Seldom. In fact, I went back through my... Now, I save most all of my text messages because I find that if you save a text message for a year, people don't lie quite as well if you have proof. I never told you that. Oh, yes, you did. That's not the way I said it. <laughs> yeah, kind of was. See, my brother, he, he, he erases his like every other week. Not me. I sat on them babies for a long time. <laughs> Are you with me? Get off that preacher. This is not helping nobody. Okay, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. My point is that seldom do I ever communicate with anyone here about what I'm about to preach. Okay? Uh, in fact, I was asked at dinner Friday night, well, you, you know what you're going to preach? Um, what well, are you going to preach Sunday morning? I'm like, I probably won't know till three minutes before I get out there. Amen. I started to be mean and say, yep, I'm preaching on men with comb-overs and the hypocrisy of women's bridges. Amen. 
<laughs> Amen. But I didn't. No, I didn't do that. I just I won't know. I don't know. I never know exactly until I get there. But we but I seldom ever communicate. And the reason that I do that is because I really believe that the Spirit of God is not something we just talk about, but he actually orchestrates things. Amen. Now, I'm not saying things couldn't be a little better organized. Maybe if I made sure that the notes are up five weeks early and that Miss Angel has my song list she needs to sing so that when I preach, it'll fit with my message and all that stuff. I I know that happens. I'm not getting on to anybody about it. If that's the way you function, that's okay. I'm not saying, listen, I got great friends, Pentecostal friends who operate just that way. It's just not the way that God has built me. So I like to know that if I've been studying, I can study alone. I I just believe this. I can be by myself at my house, studying alone, getting alone with God, reading the word, and all of a sudden, simultaneously, God can just set up straight and say, you know what? I'm going to speak to Brother Bill over here and tell him the same thing I'm telling Pastor. I'm going to speak to Bobby and tell her the same thing I'm telling Pastor. I'm going to speak to some of these different ones. I actually believe that. Amen. I believe that Prayer over the worship songs we do can actually come up with what God wanted to do without me being the one to tell everybody what to do. Concerning the man who was there that, that Christ raised up, and he said, I began to dissect that word. And look, and it literally means to be under or put under, to be, it, it's like to be subjected to, to be subjected to the devil. Why? That's so interesting is because I didn't, I wasn't studying the word lie, okay? What God had triggered in my mind was lay. Now watch this. I want you, I want you to see this. Let me read it to you again. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. And it goes on and says, blind, halt, wither. In these lay. Now the one that God triggered for Brother Bill was talking about the, the man lying in his state. When Jesus saw him lie there, now listen, and, and I'm trying to take a little time and lay this out so you'll see what, see what I'm talking about. Sometimes we wait for our miracle so long that we start letting the enemy's opinion of us or the enemy's um, vision for us take hold. All right? Bill said he looked up the word and it meant he was lying there in state under the subjection of the devil, of the evil one. Well, I didn't know until he texted me because I'd been looking up lay, and I'll share that with you in just a minute, how the multitudes lay around the pool waiting for the waters to trouble. And I didn't know until until he texted me, I went back and looked up both of them together and they're the same word. Now watch this. So God gives Bill, so I can share it with you, because if he hadn't texted me, I wouldn't be sharing this with you. I hadn't heard it, and it's not what I got out of the Word. Isn't that amazing? God is so powerful, and this, this thing is so incredible that you never know what God's going to say. But so that you would hear that the enemy can subject you. He can cause you to lie under this weight, to be under the subjection of his process, of his thoughts, and of his power. When you're trying to get your miracle. Now watch this. Here's what I looked up. And I don't know if it's simultaneously. I don't know when when all Brother Bill was doing this, when he was studying. But I'll show you what God showed me. The passage says a great many lay. The first part's kata. Which means down under or underneath. Literally. So it's the first part. It's what Bill taught on this morning. He said down under, underneath. The second part, and this is amazing because if you ever try to study Greek and Hebrew, it's tough to translate into English language. It's why there's so many translations of the Bible because so many of their words will mean four or five things of ours. So it's literally left up to the person translating into your language to decide which statement or which definition was supposed to be used when it was translated. Does that make sense? 
Because, you know, you got people that just get fighting mad if you don't use the King James. I read it. I use it. I preach out of it because that's what I grew up listening or learning my passages. So when I quote scripture, I quote it out of King James. It's what I learned. I'm sorry. I ain't taking your trucker's version and relearning it all. That's New International if you're wondering. Amen. Amen. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to start all over again at 52 years old. I'm going to speak what I know. Right? But I am going to really make some people mad right here. KJV translators are not any more perfect human beings than the other translators. Oh, boy. Now, I think it sticks pretty close. In fact, I like it because when I look up things, it stays closer than what most of the other translations do, in my opinion. However, there are times when it's like completely off base, okay? And it's just a translating area. It ain't God's word. Trust me, all right? Now listen. Kimahi is the second, is the second part of that word. And here's what it means. This, this, this was so powerful to me, and I'll share this with you, and, 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 I'll, be, and I'll be done. The first thing that popped up under that definition is, it says, of one buried. Remember, Bill said, subjected under, you're under the, with the enemy, the, the oppression of the enemy. But the second part of that word, it's a two-part word. The second part of that word means of one buried. How many knows the enemy will bury you in unbelief, in fear, in anxiety, and anything else he can come up with? I'll even tell you this. He doesn't have to kill you physically if he can destroy you spiritually. I'm preaching to you good because I are one. Are you listening? Isn't it interesting that they used the word, that that, that the multitude, and they used the Greek word for being buried? They're laying around this pool hoping the waters would trouble. I said this last week, and I had a couple questions about it. I'm going to say it again. The Bible says that God would send an angel to stir the water to trouble the water. Is that what it says? Find me one other place in the entire word of God where God did that. There is no doctrine, and you can't build doctrine on one thing. There is no doctrine of angels stirring the water. The angel was stirring the water because that's the only way some of those folks would ever believe that God could touch them. They had come to believe that as soon as the water starts stirring, if I can just get in, I'm going to get my miracle. And so that is the the, the expectation of everybody there. Their expectation determined whether or not they got healed. And here's the deal. Nobody, the Bible never reports not one person ever got healed unless they got in the water. Why? Because that was their faith system. Are you listening? It took Jesus to come. Amen? And show them, this ain't about the water at all. This is about the one who walks on water. (laughs) Amen? This is about the one who spoke the water into existence. This is about the one who just walks out on the bow of the boat and says, peace, be still, and the water's just calm and lay down. That's what it's about. It took Jesus to come and show them your faith is misplaced. Don't look for an angel to come. All you need is that I show up. Amen. Don't have your expectation that something else is going to intervene. All you need to know is that I have intervened. And when Jesus intervenes, honey, when he shows up in your situation, everything starts to change. Number two, I got to hurry, I know I do, of things that quietly cover a spot. They were lying there. It literally means of things that that quietly cover a spot. How many know that if if he can't bury you in doubt and unbelief and anxiety and worry, then if he can just slip in and quietly quench, and then you'll wake up one day and realize the great dreams and 
visions that you once had, you once believed, you don't believe anymore. I don't know how he got there. I don't even know when he came in, but quietly he came and covered. I used to have a fire in me, and somehow, like a wet blanket, he just slipped in. I don't know how many times I've had people tell me, Pastor, I didn't really do anything. I didn't go back out into my old drug life. I didn't go back out and just start drinking and doing all the stuff I used to do. But somehow, some way, little by little by little, quietly, I just begin to calm down for Jesus. I used to be a radical for Jesus, but all of a sudden, I begin to calm down. And after a while, everything is just covered up. And I'm just living my life. Listen, the enemy has many tricks. And if he can just get you, if he can just quietly slip in, just a little doubt here and there. You don't have to be so radical. For why do you, you don't need to go to church this morning. Listen, half everybody else, they're not going to. They're, they're, they're going to do what they want. to. You don't need to do that. You don't need to go forward. Listen, he, he had an altar call last week. He'll have one next week. You don't need to go in this one. And quietly, he'll just cover. Last point in this word, and I'll, I'll try to close. This is one of the most powerful in my, my opinion. And I wrote this down to go with that last one. Let me read this to you. It says, don't let the valleys you walk through redefine your expectation of the mountaintops God promised you. Amen. <laughs> Let me say that again. Don't let the valleys you walk through redefine your expectation of the mountaintops God's promised you. It's easy to do. It's just subtly, little by little, take away your faith, take away your fire. Amen? Number three, of things put or set in any place to which we used to stand. Let me say that again. Of things put in any place to which we used to stand, we as God's people are going to have to quit laying down. We're going to have to stand. Don't let him occupy your space. Amen? And it does mean politically, but it means personally too. Don't you let him knock you out. Don't you do it. I don't care how discouraging it gets. I don't care who comes against you. Don't you let him knock you out of what, God, what he's given you. What God has declared in your life, don't you let him do it. If you're in the Branson, Missouri or Eureka Springs, Arkansas area, Pastor Todd, the staff, and the congregation at Harvest Assembly want to invite you out to our services. For more information on service times and directions to our house of worship, please log on to our website at www.harvestassemblyar.com dot org.